Good, e good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Antonella Gignoli and I would like to welcome everyone to this eighth lecture of the series 2021 of lectures organized by the ERC project uh, NOTAE or NOTE if you prefer, a project which studies the presence of graphic symbols in documentary sources in the pragmatic literacy as a historical phenomenon from late antiquity to early Middle Ages. Working as paleographer or as papyrologist or as historian of the written culture, sometimes one has to, has to assume external influences to explain, for example, the use of a particular form of, of a certain graphic symbol or the use of a particular form of an abbreviation sign, the use of a particular style of writing and so on. And we have to imagine these influences brought somehow by persons. I'm, I mean uh, human beings. Uh, circulating and spreading uses, modes, ideas, and so on through their culture productions, books, documents, but also through violence armies, of course. And, um, written, and the written sources just explained in this way became af soon after um, traces of the influence itself as a, a result of a kind of um, a maneutic cycle, which is not always a virtual cycle. So studying culture productions in the past means assuming mobility of customs, uses, ideologies, religions, ideas, that is intangible things transmitted by humans. Intangible things which we try to detect in very tangible things, written sources or archaeolo archaeological sources. But what can be said about the mobility of known humans actors in the past? Does this mobility, I mean, um, have a historical dimension? I mean, in the sense of, of a historical evidence or in the sense of a subject or object of historical knowledge? How does that mean about history in, of, of the relative period? So we have the pleasure and the honor to have today as a lecturer, Johannes Preiser Capelle, who is going to talk about, I have to read, elephants, oranges, and pathogens, the global entanglement, entanglement of long late antiquity through the mobility of non-human actors, 200s, uh, 900s and not ID. And uh, I would like to, to say just a few words to present Johannes Preise Capeller for those, the few, I suppose, who don't know him. For the Twitter historians, Johannes Preise Capeller is at Bidzens for sure, so, and <laughs> he's uh, well known. Johannes Preiser Capella, I have to read this. Um, sorry, Johannes Preiser Capella, previously researcher at the Institute for Medieval Research, Division of Byzantine Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, is since 2015 senior research associate, uh, that is a full permanent position at the same institution. And he is team leader of the research group Byzantium and Beyond and of the research area Complexities and Networks. He is a lecturer at the Institute of, for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies of the University of Vienna. I would like to mention um, three books Johannes Preiser Capeller has recently published. The first one, Jens Seitz for Rome und Karl dem Kossen, Aspekte der globalen Verflechtung in der, Lang in der lange Spätantike, published by uh, Mandelbaum Verlag 2018, that I have here uh, with me. <laughs> and I read before, before or immediately after the start of the, the action of my ERC project as one of the most inspiring books I have ever read, books of history. Mm, I must say that. And in February and in March of this year, 2021, 
always uh, published by the the same Man Mandelbaum publishers, Mandelbaum Verlag, the same of this. Um, das Buch Die erste Ernte und der große Hunger, Klima, Pandemien und der Wandel der alten Welt bis 500 nach Christus. And the second one, the, 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 title is, uh, the title is Der lange Sommer und die kleine Eiszeit, Klima, Pandemien und der Wandel der alten Welt von 500 bis 1500 nach Christus. And I, I would once uh, again express my thanks to Johannes for being here. Uh, many thanks in advance for his lecture and also for sharing some material connected to this le lecture. Um, uh, the presentation as PDF file and as well as the three publication uh, among them a chapter of the book I mentioned, the Insights for Rome and um, Karl den Grossen. Uh, Maria Boccuzzi, a team member of the project, will share with all participants at the end of the lecture um, via the Zoom chat function, the link to download uh, this material. Uh, so, uh, Johannes, many, many thanks again. And uh, I, the floor is yours. I, death of, of Charlemagne, but later attributed to his treasury. Um, of course, silk or the silk road as such has become something like an epitome, so like the most powerful symbol of global entanglement in the pre-modern period, in the antiquity and in, in the medieval period. Although we know that the term silk road as such only emerged uh, from scholarship of the 19th century, and that there actually was never was only the one and only silk road. There were various routes which were used, among other things, to transport silk across uh, Afro Eurasia. However, what we find in, in ancient literature, here in the, the text of Cosmos Indico Ploestes from the 6th century, is the idea of, of a rope or of, of a cord stretching from Tsinitsa, so the land of silk, China. However, not really clear where 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 Cosmos is 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 locating it from Tsinitsa to path through Perth, Persia onwards to the Roman dominions. If we stretch a court across these countries, the middle of the earth would be quite correctly traced. So there is some idea that there is a court, an interweavement to a certain extent between these far distant regions. Um, of course, Cosmos is uh, very much aware that. China or the land of silk is much nearer to Persia and therefore also Persia has a higher profit from this trade of silk. This is connected to another well-known narrative, uh, at least here in Austria, it was even in school books, maybe also in Italy, uh, this episode uh, that Emperor Justinian wants to circumvent the Persian intermediaries for silk trade and therefore initiates it, initiates an episode of what would, we would call today industrial espionage by two monks who then bring the secret of silk production from the land of silk uh, to Byzantium, as we learned from Procopius. However, there's a different version of the same narrative in, uh, uh, which we have only in fragments in the, in the text of Theophanes of Byzantium from the late sixth century. And there, the, the, these are not two monks here, there's a certain person who uh, more or less gives over the secret of silk production to Emperor Justinian. The interesting thing is that both these narratives are obviously later constructions in order to explain how this secret uh, made its way from Inner Asia or from far distant regions to the Roman Empire. Because as we learn, for instance, from the studies of Anna Multesius, Multesius, one of the leading scholars of Byzantine silk production, we already have evidence for Byzantine silkworms and also mulberry plantations, which uh, provide the infrastructure of the silkworms already in fifth century Byzantine Syria. So ahead of these uh, espionage stories. And at the same time, we have similar narratives of smuggling also from, for other regions. And in the same way, these narratives more or less serve as personalizations of earlier anonymous transfer processes. So at the moment when already the silk production had been transferred to these countries, these narratives emerged in order to, to provide a story and an agency to this process of, of transmission. So we have this phenomenon, for instance, in Japan, where in around 300, uh, there's the, 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 the narrative that at this period, 
a Japanese ambassador uh, brought some, not only silkworms, but also women specialists of silk weaving from China to Japan. And uh, in more spectacular story uh, uh, that around 400, a Chinese princess uh, is married to the prince of Hotan in Central Asia, and that she is smuggling silkworms in her headgear. Uh, and this is even then depicted some centuries later in this wooden panel discovered by Aurel Stein in excavations in the region, so that this became obviously a, a quite popular story, this smuggling narrative. And as I said, in both cases, we know that silk production already was transported to these regions ahead the time when this supposed smuggling appeared, as is the case for the Roman Empire. So we have here similar cases of late, later personalizations of earlier anonymous transfer processes. And these narratives serve, however, a purpose which can be connected. And here I introduce some theory to one of the, the, the ideas of Bruno Latour, who is one of the thinkers of what is now called actor network theory. So that in order to reassemble the social in terms of, of an accumulation of actants, of humans and non-humans, uh, who together are able to, to bring something into existence, we have to localize the global or to globalize the local. As he wrote, we have to lay continuous connect connections leading from one location, local interactions to other places, times and agencies through which a local site is made to do something. If we do this, we will render visible the long chains of actors linking sites to one another without missing a single step. And these narratives of the smuggling of the silkworms, although they may not be accurate from a modern historical point of view, they serve this purpose. They can be identified as such narratives of entanglements. And in the same way, we can also produce modern day narratives of entanglements. This is just one example uh, from one archeological site, Moschevaya Balk in the Northwestern Caucasus, where various pieces of silk have been found dated to the 8th, 9th century. This was ob obviously a side route of the Silk Road, so to say. And these silks, these pieces of silk came from all over Eurasia, from Byzantium, from, from uh, the Arab countries, from China, from Soktia. And we have also parallel pieces in Essen and Germany. And there are even pieces of Chinese writing were found at this site. So we can also draw a map, if you would like, to, to, uh, to, to visualize these links to, to uh, globalize the local or, or localize the global as it is localized in Moschevaya Balka. So this would be what one could call the lateral dimension of global entanglements. This idea of lateral uh, dimensions I borrowed from C.A. Bailey from his great masterpiece, The Birth of the Modern World. So the lateral dimension is more or less the spatial linkages, linkages between places via, uh, via which uh, objects, ideas, know-how were exchanged. And often this was actually an, an elite phenomenon. So the exchange between courts, or between mercantile elites or between religious elites. On the other side, then we have to take into consideration a po possible vertical dimension of global entanglement. So the impact of the, these objects, of these ideas, uh, which were transported over large regions within societies beyond the elites. And this uh, vertical dimension, I'm especially also interested and I would like to bring some examples today. So, all these objects, which we may identify also in, its, in itself as manifestations of such narratives of the lateral dimension, they also may have a vertical dimension. Here, just one example, the great book of uh, Susan Whitfield on silk slaves in stupas. And she also has some examples of such pieces of silk, which were transported across Afro-Eurasia. But at the same time, uh, we have seen that the silk production as such was transported, then also each new piece of silk, which was transported from China to Central Asia, or from Central Asia to Byzantium, initiated, initiated also a vertical dimension so that motifs were imitated or adapted uh, as uh, uh, Gasparini shows uh, in her book uh, published last year. And in this one page, she is also citing uh, this, this sentence, the magic that transforms a material entity into a thing owned is a dual process of adding humans and things to each other. And there she is citing a very, also for me, interesting book of 2012 by the archaeologist Ian Hodder, 
uh, with the title Entangle. And Ian Hodder adapted uh, some of the concepts of Bruno Latour and other thinkers of Hector Network, Hector Network Theory uh, to archaeology. And uh, what Ian Hodder is writing is, 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 I would say, also decisive to think about then the vertical dimension of the transport of such uh, aspects of practices and know-how across larger periods. So he's stating to extend the rather obvious point that things depend on people by focusing on the idea that the behavior of things, plants and animal traps humans into various forms of care. Things depend on people when they are procured, manufactured, exchanged, used and discarded, but in particular they depend on people to maintain them if they are to remain as people want them, or they depend on humans to maintain the environments in which they thrive. And this dependence of things on humans draws humans deep into the orbit of things, looking after things as they get depleted or fall apart, or as they grow and reproduce, trap humans into harder labor, greater social debts and duties, changes schedules and temporalities. Humans have had increasingly to invest labor in new te technologies to manage and to the sustain these things and have found themselves organized by them. So it's not only a magic, but it also means new obligations. Uh, Ian Hodder himself is a specialist on, on uh, prehistory and Neolithic settlements, and he tried to visualize one aspect of these entanglements for the Neolithic settlement of Chatalhuic in Anatolia, um, centered around the production and procurement of clay. And this is called a tanglegram. So visualizing the entanglements between people, animals, objects, and procedures, which are necessary to bring about specific aspects of a human uh, community. Later, this was also visualized in the form of a network graph by Sean Graham. Um, and he also tried to quantify so which nodes in this tanglegram have, have higher centrality are more important than others. However, I don't know if this is really accurate with uh, regard to the original ideas of Bruno Latour who wanted to have all these actors at an eye level. And here again, it's about quantifying and, and leveling. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an interesting idea, although it was not, it's, it's until today, it's, it's always rather uh, problematic really to, to combine uh, traditional network uh, quantitative network theory with actor network theory. However, what is more important for our case today is that we can also imagine that what we have heard about the transport of silk production to other regions, that actually what was transported is this entire process, this tanglegram here, for instance, a, a, a simplified tang tanglegram, of what Anamothesius has called the immensely complex and sensitive production of silk. So all these procedures, all these knowledges, all these, these entanglements were also transported to new communities. Uh, and this we may call the agency of the silkworm. So as, as Ian Hodder said, then this is how then the silkworm entangled human beings into his or her, her or its, its sphere in order to take care of it and to produce then the silk. And this community of practice then was transported from China to Central Asia or to Byzantium, therefore, therefore providing a vertical dimension of global entanglements beyond the elites into communities. However, rarely we are inf informed how this actually took place or how this impacted communities. We have these uh, agency narratives more on an elite level, the espionage stories. Uh, so uh, what we, however, may imagine is similar to what has been described for another region to which silk production has been transported in the modern period, and that's the province of Oaxaca in Mexico, where the Spanish, since the 16th century, imported from Europe uh, silk production. And there's this very interesting dissertation of, of uh, Karen Patricia Amitage from 2008, who made an ethnographic study um, how these communities were transformed also due to more recent intensification of silk production in the region uh, over generations. And there we find that this, this, in, this import of this new practice entanglement uh, not only modified ecologies because you had to uh, plant mulberry trees, you had to grow up the silkworms, it very much changed the daily routines. It changed the distribution of work in the course of the year. It changed the distribution of work between genders or gender roles. 
Uh, so it, it, changed, it, it really modified essential elements of the life world of this community. And we can imagine that something similar happens whenever such uh, laterally transmitted uh, entanglement of, 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 of know-how, of objects, of practices is imported to another community also doing late antiquity, that we have to account with similar processes. Although we rarely find descriptions for it because it's beneath the radar of, of elite historiography. But this is, I found a very interesting parallel case uh, where we can find some, some, some mechanisms or some dynamics, which we also would expect uh, which, uh, during the late antique uh, period. So this was my introduction in terms also of, 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 um, um, of, of methods and of ideas and concepts. But let's return to the elephant in the room, so to, to this uh, visualization, uh, that this elephant was then uh, connected to Charlemagne's treasury, of course, was not by accident, because as we know, Charlemagne ex actually received an element, an elephant as a gift from Caliph Harun al-Rashid. Uh, in the Vita of Charlemagne by Einhard, we learn a few years earlier, Charles had asked him for an elephant and Harun had given him his only one. We will later see if this is really accurate, this information. We have more information about this transport of the elephant, uh, who had the name Abul Abbas uh, in the Annales Regnum Francorum. And there we learned that this was a rather complex process. So uh, various members of the retinue of Charlemagne had to be mobilized. Even a fleet had to be mobilized in Liguria to bring them the elephant from North Africa to Italy. Then they had to winter in Vercelli. Uh, one could imagine that the inhabitants of Vercelli first were very entertained by the exotic site, but then they had to feed the, the animal over the entire, during the entire winter. So maybe then the, the enthusiasm was decreasing in the following month. And then only very, very several months later, finally, Charlemagne uh, was receiving the elephant in, in Aachen in his, 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 uh, 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 in his most beloved residence. Um, this elephant is quite a popular figure now. There is even a biography written by the German medievalist Achim Thomas Hack in 2014, and there's also an historical novel, An Elephant für Karl den Großen. So maybe we will, eventually maybe there will be a movie about him. Um, and Abul Abbas, he was actually transported from Baghdad, and in order not to cross the territories of the Byzantine Empire, which was in say complex relations both with the Abbasid Caliphate and with Charlemagne at this time, he had to travel all the way during the, uh, across the Abbasid Caliphate from North Africa, across the Adriatic and then through Italy across the Alps to Aachen. So that's the itinerary which we can reconstruct. Um, and this short information only gives some, some impression again to what extent various communities across the empire had to be mobilized, both in the Abbasid Caliphate and in the Frankish Empire, in order to transport Abul Abbas from Baghdad to Aachen. So we can also, I tried here to, to draw this tangigram on the basis on the, of the information which we have from the narratives, and it only gives a very rough impression of all the communities which were entangled in this very process, which were mobilized by Abul Abbas in order to bring him to the emperor. We can also visualize this here. You have the places uh, arranged according to the geographic coordinates. You, so here you see the itinerary and we can also connect places across distances to a certain extent. If you follow the idea of Bruno Latour of uh, localizing the global and uh, globalizing the local. We could also draw it on a modern map. However, I would be very careful there because uh, via the early examples are still um, rather abstract visualizations, this would give an impression as if there would have been a direct flight from Baghdad to Aachen, which was definitely not the case in the early ninth century. So putting it on a modern map, although it can be helpful to, to, to perceive the spatial distances, also may be too, too much akin to modern day globalization narratives, where you really have an instantaneous uh, communication between uh, Korea and, 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 and Italy, for instance. That's not the case in the ninth century. So we always have to take into consideration the, the temporal uh, dimension and also the rather blurred, the blurred uh, mental maps 
people in Italy or in, in the Frankish realm had about the regions where actually the elephant came from. So this can be tricky. So let's remain with, with, this, with this kind of visualization or the just to, to visualize the narrative and the entanglements which are connected to a bula bus. There's, but there's also an, another time dimension because uh, Charlemagne, we learn also from the sources, he asked, he wanted an, an elephant. And this was because he was aware that an elephant was an element of uh, the presentation of, 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 of the, the performance of a Roman emperor. emperor. Um, so already in Aristotle's history of the animals, we learn that the elephant is, is a special animal. They are even taught to kneel before the king. We know that uh, already Roman, uh, um, Roman generals after fighting Pyrrhus or Hannibal and later uh, Oriental kings used elephants in triumphal processions as also did Roman emperors, as we see on this coin of Diocletian and Maxima, Maximianus. Elephants were transported across the Roman Empire. We have here this visualization from uh, the Villa del Casale on Sicily. And we can imagine that also Abul Abbas was transported in a similar way. So uh, bringing an elephant to his realm was more or less also completing his performance as a Roman emperor. Um, we also have here this other example from this Barbarini dipti from the early 6th century, maybe depicting Justinian, where also an elephant is depicted as, as, as uh, representing one of the continents, so also symbolizing universal imperial rule and similar uh, uh, linkages uh, in terms of ideology. We can also uh, assume that they were connected to the idea of Charlemagne that he would like to have an elephant. We also have this interesting letter written by Cassiodorus in the name of the other hat to the prefect of the city of Rome uh, towards the end of the, the Ostrogothic rule in Italy or the beginning of the war with the uh, Eastern Romans. And here we have, maybe have a visualization or a, a symbolization of the end of the great imperial heritage of, of classical ancient Rome because the elephants uh, which had remained in the city, and these were only the brazen elephants at the Via Sacra, were falling into ruins. So these last uh, symbols of universal rule, and obviously there were no real elephants left in the city, uh, was falling into ruins. And the king or Cassiodor advised the pre prefect that it is most desirable that we should preserve the images of these creatures and that our citizens should thus be familiarized with the sight of the denizens of foreign lands. Do not therefore permit them to perish, since it is for the glory of Rome to collect all specimens of the process by which the art of workmen has imitated the production of wealthy nature in all parts of the world. It wasn't then only later under the popes that we have then again such symbols of universal rule like the Bernini's elephant, uh, which you all know. So this is also, this, this letter is also, is one same marking point of the end of, of classical uh, antiquity, one could say, uh, with regard to elephants. So we have the entanglements across regions. We have the entanglements between Charlemagne and the Roman past. But, so, but of course the action animal, animal as such was creating new entanglements. If we follow Hodder, the behavior of things, plants, and animals traps humans into various forms of care. So now Charlemagne and his retinue had to take care of the elephant to feed him. The question is on which kind of knowledge they could rely. Or was, were there also some specialists coming with the elephant who could teach uh, the Carolingians how to take care of the animal? Could they rely on traditional knowledge so traces of Aristotle's description of how to take care of an animal, which we could find in the literature, that's not clear. What we know is that the uh, elephant uh, actually survived for eight years and died in 810, uh, doing the preparations for an, a campaign against the Danes, against Danish invaders. And obviously Charlemagne wanted to impress these enemies uh, with bringing the elephant. Unfortunately, the elephant, uh, died then at a, a military camp near Lippeham at the Rhine. Uh, suddenly, as we learn, uh, the Kali, the elephant that Harun the had sent to Charlemagne died in 810. And here you see a visualization of this nice site of Lippeham, uh, modern day Bislich at the lower Rhine. Uh, what is interesting, however, and here we come to another aspect of entanglements and also of the title of my lecture, which is, which is about pathogens. And here you see some cows on this meadow. 
and they may have had a fatal impact on the elephant because uh, a few lines later we learned that on this very campaign where the elephant died, also a violent cattle epidemic, a boom pestilentia broke out that almost not a single head of cattle remained alive for such a large army, but all but the, but the last one perished. And not only here, but in all the countries subject to the emperor, the epidemic raged in the most terrible way among these species of animal. So maybe the death of the elephant was also because it got infected by, by the same pathogens, which were decimating uh, the cattle of the, 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 the campaign of the army of Charlemagne, but this is only speculation. Uh, I'm referring here especially to the uh, research of Tim Newfield, who is a leading specialist of both uh, famines and, and epidemics in the early medieval West. Uh, and we are waiting for the publication of his wonderful dissertation. And he, based on, on various sources, uh, reconstructs also the spread of this epidemic, of this epidemic among cattle. So it originated within the Carolingian realm in modern day Austria, uh, near the border to the Avars, and then uh, spread along the Danube, and then down the Rhine, eventually also arriving in the military camp of Charlemagne, where also then Abul Abbas died. But it also spread towards southern France, towards Italy, towards southern France and northern Spain, and eventually even to England. So it's also mentioned in English sources. We can also imagine that the spread of this disease was eased by the increased mobility of humans and animals within the new empire of Charlemagne. So we already learned that, that animals and humans were mobilized for the campaign against the Danish. And we know there was an increased exchange of people and of objects and of animals uh, doing campaigns and for other purposes across the new realm of Charlemagne. And this may have eased also the spread of this pathogen. However, it may have originated from beyond the borders of the empire. We don't know which pathogen was responsible for this disease. One candidate would be the Rinderpest virus, uh, which is akin with uh, human measles and, and the canine distemper virus. And uh, it's on the one hand, it's highly contagious. And on the other hand, it has an incubation period of up to three to four days. So infected animals still can migrate some distance and then can uh, infect other animals before they got ill. And in populations which have never been exposed to this pathogen, the mortality rate is up to 80-90%, which would be uh, uh, accurate with regard to the reports which we find in the Carolingian sources. And Tim Newfield has uh, the idea that this pathogen originated from beyond the Carolingian realm, maybe coming from the Eurasian steppes. And there are two, uh, two, two bases for this hypothesis. One is that various of these larger scale cattle epidemics, which are reported in uh, late antique, early medieval sources, uh, are near to periods where we have migrations or encounters with groups coming from the steppes. This may have been already the case in the fourth century, although this cattle pandemic of 376 to 386, in another paper, Tim Newfield has made very, very uh, clear that this may have been only a historiographic construction, that it never took place in the way it is described in the sources. However, we have another description in Frankish sources for 569, 570, which would uh, follow the arrival of the Avars and then also the migration of the Lombards to Italy. We have another report about such an epidemic in Frankish sources for 791 uh, after or during a campaign against the others. The same could be the cause for the outbreak of 809, 810, uh, 810. And we also have another outbreak then in the Ottonian period in 939, 940, where it can be, could be connected to advances of the Madias, who had established themselves some decades before in the Carpathian Basin. So that these, these are maybe a coincidences, However, we know from later periods where we have better documentation that these pathogens could actually travel across the entire Eurasian steppes from East Asia to Europe within several years. Uh, one example uh, 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 described by Bruce Campbell in his book is for instance in the late 13th and early 14th century where we have an outbreak of such, maybe it was Rinderpest also in Mongolia before then arriving in Russia and East Asia and then also in Central Europe all the way to England in the following uh, years and decades and uh, bringing uh, immense havoc among the cattle in all these countries. 
and even better documented the outbreak of rinderpest here. It's relatively clear that it is this pathogen uh, in Mongolia and then traveling across Eurasia within a few years until arriving even in Western Europe and in England in the early 18th century. So this could be parallel cases. So this would be entanglements of pathogens and those are the agency of pathogens. Uh, uh, which we could can can reconstruct on the basis of modern day considerations uh, and also reconstructions. However, it's always interesting. We have seen that we have also always contemporaneous narratives of agency. Uh, how content, con contemporaneous observers identified the agency between this epidemic, and here again, uh, it is it attributed not to some pathogen, but it is attributed to human action. And we have this interesting passage in the, the text uh, of Agobard of Lyons from uh, the 830s about uh, the, the storms and, and the torments. And he is, he is uh, describing that people in the case of this cattle epidemic of 810 developed something like a conspiracy theory, said that Duke Grimwald of Benevent, who at that time was at war with Charlemagne, had sent people with the dust which they were to spread on the fields and mountains, meadows and rivers, and that it was because of this dust that they spread that cattle died. He, of course, says they did not rationally consider how such dust could be made, how it could kill only cattle and not other animals, how it could be carried and spread over such a vast territory by humans, nor did they consider whether there were enough benevolent men and women, old and young, to go out from the region and wield cowards lo loaded down with such dust, such as the great foolishness that oppresses the rich world, but nevertheless, and Agobard himself is saying that this was a widespread narrative, we have here contemporaneous, contem contemporaneous interpretation of agency of entanglement across regions, which we can contrast with what we can reconstruct on the basis of modern day historiography or, or other uh, evidences. Uh, what uh, observers of the ninth century were able to identify was a connection between uh, weather extremes and the outbreaks of such uh, pestilentiae among humans and, 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 and animals. Another case was in 820 where we have this description. And he also modern day uh, scholarship can identify some global connections. Uh, actually we have at the, in the early ninth century a period of increased variations of climate and, and an increased frequency of weather extremes across Afro-Eurasia which can be connected to the transition of what has been called the late antique cold period to the incipient medieval climate anomaly. And we find these, these climatic variations in various proxy data, also from tree rings. We have a sequence of droughts, then of very uh, cold winters, then of very uh, wet summers again. So, so uh, a high frequency of extremes, not only in Europe, but also in other parts of Afro-Eurasia. Uh, this is by, uh, from a recent article by Nicola de Cosme and his colleagues where they were also able to identify on the basis of Chinese sources and of natural scientific proxy data that we have a similar uh, higher frequency of such weather extremes, for instance, in the Mongolian steppes, uh, where they contributed, uh, where extreme winters and droughts contributed to the outbreak of epidemics among livestock and humans and contributed to the collapse of what was, is, was then the Uyghur Khanate, uh, the predominant power in the steppes since the mid eighth century. And this may have been also, this is just a speculation, maybe actually the pathogen, which we then find in, in, in the Carolingian Empire may have originated in this region and then crossed, uh, uh, crossed uh, or the Eurasian steppes as we have seen in later cases, but it's only just a speculation at the moment. However, also with regard to these weather extremes in the early ninth century, we also have a, a contemporaneous description or, or a contemporaneous narrative about agency. And this is again narrated by Agobard of Lyons. And he is telling us that many people believe that there, that there would be storm makers who, which were, who were able to actually create storms by human will. And that they were paid by people coming with cloud ships from a certain region, which is called Mangonia. And these aerial sailors made a payment to the storm makers and took the grain and other groves which they had destroyed uh, via their, their, their magic. Uh, of course, he again says this, that that's complete stupidity, but nevertheless, it's also an interesting 
uh, near uh, uh, an, an interesting narrative of people of the time, which we find here narrated by a member of the elite, about far-ranging connections and 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 and, and entanglements. Uh, in, in, of, again, especially of, centered around the uh, agency of humans and not of, of non-human factors to a certain extent. Uh, now I will make a rather uh, uh, dramatic uh, switch to, to, to back to elephants via this book of Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée uh, uh, used these descriptions of Magoni and Agobat of Lions in order to make a case that this is actually referring to early encounters with aliens coming with flying saucers to 9th century Frankish Empire. Uh, so ancient aliens already uh, at this time in the 1960s. He also wrote another book. He actually is a physicist. He also wrote another book, Network Revolution. And in this book, he has a very nice uh, image of an elephant. So let's get to, back to the elephant. Uh, Einhard wrote that this elephant, Abul Abbas, sent to Charlemagne was the only one at that time to be found in Abbasid Baghdad. Was this actually the case? This, we, we may doubt this because we have another description from the year 970, 917, when a Byzantine delegation came to Baghdad and then they had a big reception in the Abbasid uh, palace. And they were also shown various animals, tamed animals, including, as we read here, four elephants, each attended by eight persons together with two giraffes, which amazed the envoys. Next, they were led out to a hall containing a hundred lions, 50 on the right side and 50 on the left. And later also when these delegates left Baghdad, they also were then uh, led through a line of these animals again when they were leaving the Abbasid capital. They were not only, only shown an, uh, animals, but also exotic plants, so palm trees, and also uh, large orange trees. And this is, we will, we will refer, refer to this later. Uh, however, this was not uh, long at the palace uh, of Harun al-Rashid. In between, the Abbasids for some time had relocated their residence to Samarra, and only in 892, they returned to Baghdad, and the Khilafa, the, the uh, palace of the Caliph, was relocated from the original round city, which had fallen in ruins, to the other side of the Euphrates. So it was a different setting. However, we may assume that also in the Abbasid period of Harun al-Rashid and his successors, Successes. There were, were was a considerable number of exotic animals around in, uh, animals around in Baghdad. We learn, for instance, that that Al Mamun, the son of Harun al Rashid, received a letter from the king of India, and India is always here connected in this text with fragrances, with gold, and with exotic animals. Uh, that the king of India has in his stable one thousand white elephants, and he sent the skin, uh, floor coverings made of the skin of a snake that lives in the Maraj Valley of a type that can swallow an elephant. That's also an, a, 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 um, a prominent motif. We also find it in the Physiologus. We also find it in Western medieval bestiaries, as you see here, that there exist serpents, giant snakes, pythons, or dragons, which could actually swallow an elephant. And they, they, these are the arch enemy of the ele an elephant. And we also find this in this Arab text. Uh, later, another uh, governor of Sindh, so the part of Pakistan, India, which was already under the rule of the caliphs, sent to Caliph Al-Watik various exotic animals. And here we have somehow a resonance of, of also Charlemagne being eager to, to receive these exotic animals, that also the caliph was much more interested to get the, to receive the animals than the other presents, and he ordered the letter to be sent to speed up delivery. He wanted to see these animals, birds and tigers. And uh, in a later period uh, episode, we also learned that an enormous elephant was sent from India to Baghdad, the biggest that anyone had ever seen, together with antelopes similar to cows of blackish color. Color this may have been Nilga antelopes, as, as they can be found in India until today. So India was the source. So more or less, India was the caliphal, uh, was the Abbasid Caliphate uh, uh, of of the Abba, Abba, uh, Abbasid. So uh, the Orient of the Orient, one could say, similar the source of exotic animals as Baghdad was for the Carolingians. However, India was also the source of exotic plants, especially uh, originally very exclusive new form of citrus fruits lemons and origins, or oranges, and we see that also in the palace such trees were on display when the Byzantine delegates arrived. 
Uh, again, we know from modern paleogenetic reconstructions that the seedless fruits originated in Southeast Asia and various variants emerged and were cultivated and then especially uh, also migrated towards the West via India. Very early already, already before the Christian era, the Citrus Medica, the citron, uh, which cannot be eaten uh, un unprocured, uh, migrated to the West. Uh, we find evidence in Jewish texts, we find evidence in papyri, uh, we find evidence in, in archaeological findings in, 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 in Egypt, for instance. And then this fruit also migrated, for instance, to Roman Italy. So we have a depiction from Pompeii, and we have one, only one recipe in Apicius collection, where also citrons are used in the cuisine. Uh, however, as again, what we also find is that this plant was not only by itself transported also all the entanglements. The practices necessary to grow this plant were transported with it also to the Mediterranean. We have a description from the Geoponica, a collection of the 10th century, but also, but very much including uh, material from earlier centuries. And here this passage, passage comes from Florentinus, so from the third century, that these were very delicate plants, even within the climate of the Mediterranean. It was rather complex to grow them. And we even have references to what we would later find in the early modern period of orangeries, which a uh, well of Romans would build in order to grow these prestigious plants uh, in, on, on, on their, in, in their villas. So it was a tricky fruit. And the same is true for the later uh, uh, kinship of the Citrus Medica, which was transported to the West, so the, the, which had a better taste by themselves, oranges and lemons. And we learned that several times Caliphs, Al Mamun and Al Kahir, tried to transport such trees via ship to Baghdad. However, these unruly fruits always lost their taste. So once they were grown and in Baghdad, they would not produce the same taste uh, the Arabs had encountered in India. Only in the 10th century, then eventually, the Arabs were able to, say, disentangle or transport the entire entanglement of know-how also to Arabs' land and to grow these fruits in greater quantities. And here again, we have, we have another dimension of, of, of a vertical impact of, 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 of a global entanglement. Once these fruits were, were available in greater quantities, they very much modified food ways at large in the Arab Persian cuisine. So if we compare Apicius, where we have one recipe with citron in one of the most uh, popular medieval cookbooks of Syria from the 13th century, we have seven recipes with citron, 24 with oranges and 104 with lemons. So this is also an aspect we have to take into consideration. And food waste, I would guess, is the most central element of, of everyday life of people. And these are, were, were modified along, along uh, uh, larger periods, but in a very significant way. So again, global history is not only about elites and it's not a modern uh, idea coming from globalization, but it's also relevant to understand the modification of local communities within late antiquities also at, 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 at an ele elementary level. Um, this can be connected to another general debate uh, to which I will, will uh, shortly refer here, uh, which is the idea that there was something like an Arab agricultural re revolution. Of course, the Arab expansion in a new way connected ecologies between the Mediterranean, Central Asia, Africa and the Indian Ocean. And this allowed to a large extent also for the migration of, of non-human actors of plants especially. And already in 1983, Andrew Watson had this idea of an Arab agricultural revolution, uh, that new crops, new technology and new demands were emerging in the Arab Islamic empire. And he made a list of, of crops which were imported to the Arab Islamic world, uh, some of them coming from Africa, some of them coming from East Asia, but India being the most central intermediary or the most important source including seedless fruits, but also cotton, rice, and so on, which then were transported to the Mediterranean, revolutionizing agriculture. This was the idea of Andrew Watson. However, uh, new studies have re-evaluated Watson's uh, scenario, and based on a new reading or a more, a more uh, detailed reading of written evidence, 
but also especially on the basis of paleobotany uh, coming from various sites, two very interesting sites in uh, Egypt, Berenike, one of the most important harbors of the connections between Roman Egypt and India until the sixth century, and Klisma, which interestingly had two phases of activity until the fourth century in the Roman period, and then again from the ninth century onwards in the Islamic period. And one can compare these two phases, which paleobotanic remains of which fruits can be found in the first and in the second period. And you see here other studies which are summing up these findings. And what we see here is that actually we should not speak about the revolution, but about an intensification. Uh, with the exception of the citrus fruits, uh, lemons and oranges, which were really newcomers to the Mediterranean, almost all other fruits uh, Watson is referring to were already around in the Mediterranean in late antiquity or in the Roman period, like rice, for instance, which was grown in various regions of the Eastern Mediterranean. And we find rice in four recipes of Apicius. What we find in the Arab period is an intensification of the movement of species, of technologies, of demands. So we also see that, for instance, we have much more recipes with rice than in this cookbook from the 13th century. Uh, so these are the processes we have, we, we have to take into consideration. These connections, of course, very much uh, were maritime across the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean summer is also described in Arab sources, something like the uh, Mediterranean of long late antiquity and via this uh, ocean also the Arab Islamic Empire following up earlier sea traveling of the Sasanian period uh, travelers made their way to Southeast Asia and even to China itself uh, we learned that in three months one could travel travel from Baghdad via Siraf to Canton in southern China and here really emerged also a colony of overseas merchants of, of Arabs and Persians as we also learned from Chinese sources uh, and now coming to China, China uh, experienced a similar process of reunification of, of, of divided political entities, but also of ecologies. Between the early 4th and the late 6th century, we have a southern Chinese polities and various polities in northern China, and only at the end of the 6th century, uh, a, a unified Chinese empire emerged again under the Sui and Tang dynasty. And the Sui and Tang also very much connected now these uh, previously separated ecologies in a new imperial ecology, most famously by the Great Canal, which connected the river basins of the Huanghe and the Yangtze, also for the coming millennia, being the most important axis of infrastructure for imperial Chinese history. And via this, they also entangled the ecosons of the north and the south, and this also contributed to, the, to the, the migration of various plants, of various crops uh, between these regions. Well, we also learned that exotic crops, similar to the citrus fruits in the Arab realm, were imported to China. Uh, so, for instance, sugar cane and also tea, which first showed up in the south and then also became popular in the north, also with the help of Buddhism, uh, using Buddhist monks, using these 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 these. Uh, these uh, commodities, um, so thereby also very much modifying food waste. So today we very much connect tea with China, but it's, it, it, it is, this is a result of this vertical dimension of the lateral connection, which we find in this period, similar to what we find in the Arab Islamic Mediterranean. Uh, what is also initiated was a process of migration. So over the following centuries, the South became the demographic a focus of China. So eventually then more people were living in the south, the southern provinces than in the north due to the migration within these areas. Maybe the most, the largest in terms of numbers, the largest migration process in late antiquity. If, as, as, at, at least we have here some ideas of numbers in contrast to other regions. However, and here we make a return to the elephants, uh, this also resulted in a further retreat of the elephants, and this is the title of Mark Elvin's Environmental History of China. Uh, in antiquity, elephants were even found in northern China. Uh, by the 6th century uh, CE, they had been very much, uh, uh, had retreated to the south of China, and during this process of settlement, they even retreated more to the south, uh, to the southernmost parts of China. So ch elephants, uh, more or less disappeared over the centuries from large parts of China. Elephants, however, were also imported to China from other regions, again, as diplomatic gifts parallel. So, so this would, be, would also be parallel cases to Abul Abbas. 
And here we have uh, even more, more in, in impressive information. In total, between 630 and 771, uh, 33 elephants were transported from various polities in Southeast uh, Asia, in modern-day Cambodia, in Southern Vietnam, to the Chinese courts in Chang'an and Luoyang. In 771, 11 elephants at once. However, as we have seen in the case of Abu Labas, uh, these elephants also brought entanglements with them. One had to take care of them, one had to feed them. And in 779, the new emperor, De Thong, decided that this was too costly in the rather temperate climate of northern China. So he decided to relocate the 32 elephants, which were found at the Chinese court at this site, to a more thousand uh, area, uh, 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 an imperial uh, uh, park at Mount Qingcheng. And these elephants were brought there and lived there together with some remaining populations of indigenous elephants. And interestingly, this same Mount Qingcheng is also today one of the centers of Chinese program to preserve the giant panda, uh, which has become a modern day uh, object of diplomatic exchange. As uh, so also, for instance, uh, the Viennese too got some pandas from China as a diplomatic gift. So we have a continuity from the Tang period up to a certain extent. However, similar to what we have seen in the Carolingian example, where the increased mobility uh, may have eased the spread of this cattle epidemic, we also have a new connection of disease ecologies between the south, south and the north of China. Already a few years after the Great Canal was built, we have the first big outbreak of an epidemic from 636, uh, 636 onwards, spreading across various provinces of China. Um, so this is, is also a similar unintended effect of, of imperial entanglement that we have that this also eases the spread of these pathogens. And we have an interesting comment here to an earlier period of, of epidemics at the end uh, of, of the Han dynasty in the late uh, second and the first uh, early third century. And this is uh, by the prince and poet uh, Zhao Ji. He was the son of the famous general Zhao Zhao. Uh, so the one who is fighting the battle on, at, the, at the Red Cliff, if you have uh, read the, the famous uh, Chinese novel. And he is referring to this epidemic in the year two, 217. And here we have an interesting echo of Abogad. So, but those who are infected are only those who are clothed in coarse garments, have crude plants for food and live in humble huts made of thorn bushes. Few of those families that live in palaces eat from big pots and wear linen sable robes are affected. Now, when yin and yang lose their position relative to each other and cold and heat occur at the wrong time, that is the cause of an outbreak of epidemics. The ignorant masses hang up charms to intimidate the demons. That is really quite ridiculous. So we also have here again uh, a reference to a popular narrative, how this epidemic emerged, contrasted with the scientific explanation Chao Chi is, 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 is providing. But again, this is an interesting echo also of, of what Abogad is writing about the, uh, the popular ideas, how, for instance, this cattle pandemic uh, was created by, 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 by some, some dust spread by the agents of the Beneventian prince. Uh, this again can be contrasted with what we know about the modern day entanglements around the pathogen, uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, here we could say a tangigram of this bacterium. And actually, Chao Chi was, was right that climate plays a role in the mechanism bringing around the outbreak of such a pandemic. Um, and especially climatic fluctuations in the areas where this pathogen is in the genus can, uh, can increase the probability that the pathogen spills over from uh, a wildlife population to, to uh, rats and other domestic uh, animals which, which live with, with humans and eventually then to the outbreak of a pandemic. And uh, as we know now from modern day paleogenetic reconstruction, the pathogen behind the Justinianic plague, this has become clear over the last 10 years, was Yersinia pestis. So this bacterium originally identified during the third big plague pandemic in the late 19th century. So various uh, graveyards with victims of this pandemic, pandemic uh, traces, paleogenetic traces of this bacterium has have been identified. And it was also possible to the position of this uh, pathogen uh, within the family tree of uh, Yersinia pestis. So there were various variants emerged over the millennia from the originally identified variant in the late 19th century 
the, the variant which caused the Black Death, then the Justinianic plague variant, and then even an earlier variant, which was identified in the last years, which was already around in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia uh, 4,000 years ago. And it was also possible to identify, one could see, relatives uh, of these uh, variants and the possible region of origin of these variants of the pathogen. And the highest density of a variety of these pathogens can be found in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, what is now the northwest of the People's Republic of China and the northeast of Th Tibet. And maybe from there, this pathogen spread across Afro-Eurasia after these climatic fluctuations, which uh, have been connected to the 536 dust wheel event, which is also described by uh, Procopius, where it also connects this event then to the, 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 the calamities which followed, including the pestilence, as we see in this prominent um, passage. We have similar descriptions from all over Eurasia, from Irish chronicles to Chinese and Japanese sources. And we have also now a paleoenvironmental proxy data, which helps us to reconstruct the actual variances in climate and precipitation and temperatures. And it's also very fairly clear now that actually the, 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 the factor bringing about these fluctuations were big volcanic uh, eruptions in 536 and in 540, also initiating a longer lasting period of cooling, which is now called the late antique Little Ice Age. Um, and we may reconstruct the root of the spread of the epidemic from Central Asia via India and the Red Sea to Egypt. And we learn from Procopius that the plague first occurred in Pelusium in Egypt and then made its way across the Mediterranean. However, again, we have this narrative of Procopius about an agency of the plague. The plague is described like an agent in itself, moving around, then returning to regions it had spared before, following specific passes from the coast inland. So it's interesting also how here an, an, an eyewitness is, is describing the plague like, like an entity which has its own will. Uh, again, also as a counterpart to the modern day paleogenetic narrative I have just described. Uh, maybe we can refer this, to this in the discussion. As you know, there's now a big debate on the actual demographic effects of the Justinianic plague. Again, but returning again to the elephants one last time before coming to the end uh, quickly. Uh, we know that the plague arrived in Constantinople most probably via sea. And the biggest harbor at the time uh, was the Theodosius Harbor, operational since the 5th century until the 11th century, which has been excavated in Istanbul in the last 15 years in Yenikape, uh, found during the building of an underground. With, there were 37 shipwrecks, but they also found here tens of thousands of bones of animals uh, who obviously didn't survive the sea transport and then were thrown in the harbor basin. And among the thousands of horses, cattle, and sheep, we also find more exotic animals. We find camels, ostriches, monkeys, gazelles, and nine elephants. So these were unfortunate conspecifics of Abu Labas, uh, which didn't survive the sea transport and were immediately thrown in the basin. Others of the family would then later be found in the zoo of the imperial palace, or maybe even in the in the hypodrome. So we also have later descriptions that although they were, were, not, were not longer fightings of gladiators, that uh, animals, wild animals were fighting each other also during the Christian period in Constantinople, as you see here on the mosaic of the Great Palace. So if we can trace this back to Egypt, most probably with the grain transport for Egypt, Pelusian and to the Red Sea, the route back, this again can be connected. And here we come also back to the oranges, to the earlier movement of exotic commodities from India via the Red Sea to Egypt. And we have a long list in various sources uh, in the custom terrace of Alexandria or in the Periplus of the Red Sea. And we know that there was a regular maritime transport between Rome and Egypt and India uh, and up to the seventh century when then uh, Egypt was lost to the Byzantines. What we find, however, and this is again also about this lateral dimension that these modifications of demands of food waste are enduring. They are also enduring after imperial frameworks uh, col collapse, enduring after the catastrophe of the plague, the loss of Egypt. And we have here a description of, of exotic indulgences, which are sold by the Murepsoi 
uh, in Constantinople, according to the Sea Book of the City IPAC from around 900. We also have an interesting passage that they should position themselves near the Hagia Sophia and the Imperial Palace so that their fragrance should serve befitting the holy image and the delight of the Imperial courtyards. So also an agency of these commodities in order to contribute to the, to the performance of the church and of the emperor. And we also find in doing an enduring demand for these indulgences also in the post-Roman West. This is just one example, the privilege of uh, King Hilperic also renew, uh, renewing earlier charters of Merovingian uh, uh, kings for the monastery of Corby in northern France. And here we find a list of commodities which we know already from the Roman period, but we also find new commodities. And if, if we put this on a, on a map, what we can see is that in red, we have uh, commodities, which we already know from the Roman period. In yellow, these are, one could say, newcomers, which we then find after the Arab period. And this old and new exotica then, then were transported via the Arabic empire to the Byzantine and Frankish empires, uh, then meeting the demand, the enduring demand, which had emerged in the previous imperial periods in the Roman period. And on this basis, we also find in groups like the Radania merchants, which were really traveling across all these routes. So we have here the description uh, from an Arab source of the ninth century that they were traveling from Western Europe all the way to China, from the steppes of, of East Eastern Europe, all the way to Africa. So this was really a global community connecting all these, all these various, uh, various regions on the basis of the demands of the foodways, of, of the expectations of course, within the elites, but also beyond, which had emerged due to earlier uh, global exchanges across these regions. And so if we talk about late antiquity in terms of, of, of uh, connectivity, of course, we have the process of fragmentation in the Roman and post-Roman West, uh, and also then in the Byzantine sphere. But this is only the Western periphery of a world system, which was very much centered uh, around the Indian Ocean and where we find an intensification from the seventh century onwards in the empires of the Umayyads and the Abbasids of the Tang. And uh, within this world system, Byzantium and also the Frankish Empire are only the Western peripheries, although they still want to participate on the basis of, of, of ideas and, and, and demands created in the earlier periods. So in order to end this with, again, one elephant, uh, one, what I wanted to show in this, in this talk is uh, that global history is, is not only a, a modern idea emerging from modern days idea, uh, modern day ideas of globalization, and that it is not only an elite phenomenon, but uh, it helps us to understand the dynamics to get from the global to the local, that we also can have micro histories of local communities where, whose dynamics can only be explained due to earlier wide ranging over regional connectivity from the lateral to the vertical, from beyond the elites to the Lebenswelt, to the life worlds of individuals and communities in terms of demands, practices and beliefs. And for this purpose, we can contrast the narratives of agency and entanglements of the past. So what Agobat is telling us, what Procopius is telling us, uh, what the Chinese prince is telling us of what people believed, how they reconstructed agencies or the personalization of the transport of the silk worm in these espionage stories, which we find in China and Central Asia and in Byzantium, and the present narratives, um, which we very much now can create on the basis of archaeology, paleozoology, paleobotanics, paleogenetics, paleoclimatology, and so on. Although we also have to bear that this, that this also to a certain extent are still also narratives. So uh, it's not always so clear, even if we draw a line on a map, that's also a narrative created by an historian or by a scholar, which we can then put along the narratives, which we find in historiographical sources. Uh, Antonella has already referred to the books uh, where you can also find of some of these ideas. And with this, uh, uh, I hope that you can also then uh, 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 find some of the material in the PowerPoint, uh, which you then can download. I, I know that this was a lot of material, but I wanted to present also various aspects from various uh, regions in order to also to have some basis for the discussion. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I will stop now the uh, screen sharing and hand over back to Antonella. Ah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this impressive talk. And so um, 
I give, please, uh, who wants to, to ask questions, to comment, uh, feel free to take the floor directly uh, after, of, of course, presenting himself or names and so on. Please feel free to, uh, I, I'm reading the, the comments on the chat. Um, please, Mirella, um, could you share the, the link? I sent you previously. I think it's already in the chat what I yes, is a, yeah, It's already, sure. I think yes, it's already. already. <laughs> Excuse me. So please. If... Too, too much material. <laughs> it's very the elephants, yeah. impressive. Yes, dance. <laughs> so, Giuseppe? No, no. Yes, yes, I have a... A little question. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a little question about the name of the elephant. Mm -hmm. um, I find I find uh, it's very interesting that uh, Charmaine uh, did not change uh, his name. Uh, what do you think about <laughs> the name? Uh, is this also an uh, Yes, a, a sign of uh, entanglement. What do you think about it? That the name of the elephant has, yes. has been quite debated because in the, the source it's Abul Abbas yes. somehow. And the idea is that it is Abul Abbas. Mm -hmm. uh, so referring also to the mm -hmm. could say founding father of, of the Abbasid uh, dynasty. Um, and uh, But that's that's not clear. There, is, there are some several speculations that there may be also other other name forms behind this, also some Indian name forms that Abul Abbas is only the one who could say the nearest which comes comes to the mind. And then it of course would be connected also to, to the dynasty of, 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 of the Caliph. Um, and um, one could imagine that uh, this, this entire ensemble of the elephant with the gifts and the name provided by the, by the delegates uh, added also to the prestige, so that that that, that it's also clear that that, that the exotic name, I, we don't know to what extent. Uh, since we don't know what what was the original name from, if they would have been aware that this would refer to to maybe the dynastic name of of of, of Harun Ar Rashid, who is also referred to as Aaron in the sources, and and uh, that's that's not clear. But I would guess that that the name as such. Uh, is 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 also part of of of, of the flair of of the of the prestige of of the object. So I I, I remember also when when uh, the Viennese so got these two great pandas from China, it was clear they should get a Chinese name or two Chinese names. So they are not Maria and Peter, but they are, have Chinese names because that's also part of the exotic flair. And maybe that's something similar what 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 we see here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would just say that uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Albertoni is the author of the recent book. Uh, um, the title is um, L'Elefante di Carlo Magno, published by Mulino, I think. Yes. Uh, Giuseppe, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Mulino. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, is your, what is your idea about the name? Yeah, my idea is that uh, it's very interesting that, that uh, uh, Charmaine uh, do not change the name. Yeah. So this is a, a very uh, important uh, uh, sign of communication with, uh, with uh, uh, the Caliph. Uh, yeah. So this is, I think this is very important. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please, had a further questions, comments? Paolo, do you have some? <laughs> yes. Please, Paolo Tedesco. I am Paolo Tedesco. I am not a scholar, so uh, I have to introduce myself. Um, thanks a lot for your uh, enormous overview of, uh, of uh, the global connectivity between this, uh, so Eurasia and also Africa. So in the last part of your paper, if I understood correctly, you said that one of the main factors prompting uh, this uh, connectivity, so the continuous exchange along across the 
the seventh century of long date antiquity was the demand, not just the demand of the elite, but the demand of uh, the local population. So you are, you are implying uh, that these people, they are demanding for these commodities at different level. Uh, they are able to create wealth or at least some surplus mm -hmm. in order to exchange with this. But during uh, your paper, you never refer to system of production, mm -hmm. so how they organize the production and how they actually selected, uh, if there is a, a strategy, um, a certain type of, pro of commodities that could be appealing for the people that uh, they are uh, um, um, connecting the different uh, part. This is so. The, the first question would be about production, because normally in the model uh, analyzing, investigating the the exchange in the Mediterranean system or with the Indian Ocean uh, production as 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 an important point. The second uh, uh, question, which is related actually. Um, um, I think that implicitly, if uh, I understand correctly, you put at the center of your model uh, the agency of the merchant communities as main, so who's one, one of the... Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be, actually it's also a question I'm trying to solve, but why in our period the merchant communities are, are so invisible? So, so they are really difficult to trace in our sources, even though we know that they are, they are there, mm -hmm. but we don't have sources uh, uh, identifying this community like, like uh, for instance, for imperial officers or uh, so whether uh, other, other uh, bodies or category of people. So this, so this is my... Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, for the first question, of course, that's very hard to trace in, in, in the sources. Um, I'm, I'm here very much referring also to, to uh, results of archaeology like Jörg Trauschke's studies on, on, on exotic objects in post-Roman Western Europe, who, for instance, uh, uh, mapped this, uh, the distribution of garnet uh, as, as, as one uh, Halb Edelstein, as we say in, in German, yeah. and where also due to archaeometric um, analysis, they could find out that all the garnet until the 7th century was still coming from India and Sri Lanka all the garnet which can be found in graves in, in Central Europe or in the Frankish Empire. And this garnet is not only in elite graves, it's very far distributed, also in, in local communities in Bavaria, in, 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 in Upper Austria. Interestingly, also in some of the graves where they found this uh, paleogenetic evidence of, 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 of the Yersinia pestis. Um, so there was still a wide distribution up to the 7th century of these objects, even obviously after, until the late 7th century, after the loss of Egypt to, to the Arabs, uh, beyond, beyond the elites. And then um, this garnet from India and Sri Lanka disappears in the late 7th century, and it's replaced with garnet coming from Bohemia, from the Czech Republic, where there was always garnet of more or less similar quality, and uh, the idea of Jörg Trauschke is there were some ideas that this was connected. Okay, the garnet from India was not longer available, but it is available decades after the loss of Egypt. So it's, it cannot be the immediate impact. And it's also not connected to some warfare in India. Uh, but he, his ideas, and, and, and you can find more on this in, 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 his, in, his, in his book, that this was also a, a, a change in taste of, 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 the, of say, the customers. Uh, that, that, that and we know that the garnet from India was still exported maybe to Egypt and it would still have been available, but then they 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 move to the, or they change for this garnet which is from a more nearby source. Of course, it could also be connected to costs and and, and but it would also have been available before. But this is his idea that this could this is a reflection of, of an actual change also of 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 of, of a fashion in, within a larger community. So, uh, of course, we do not find this in the written sources, but on the basis of this large scale archaeological evidence, this could be, could be such an example where, where we also see a replacement of, of, of a demand which had been created under, in the Roman period, is, is maintained until the late 7th century, and then, then is, is changing uh, dramatically. 
However, of course, also what is missing in this narrative and also the Trauschke has a lot of problems also to tracing the, 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 the merchants uh, bringing this, 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 this elements. Of course, he's, he's, he's referring to, to the theory, the Syrians, which we see in various sources in the Carolingian, uh, in the Frankish sources and so on, as being more or less indicating a group coming from the East and bringing this material to the West. Uh, so that's 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 really really also very very hard to trace, and of course not also not in the archaeological evidence. Uh, if we do not have you know s single findings like most Shavaya Balka, where we also have next to this Chinese silk uh, two Chinese documents, where we have uh, a Buddhist prayer and what has been interpreted as a list of commodities this Chinese merchant had with him. And that's of course a speculation that this was actually Chinese merchants which who made all the way to 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 most Balka, but at least we have here this evidence. Um, uh, we don't have anything comparable to to the rich evidence which we have for the Soktians, for instance, in in China, where where we have an entire community also the emerging, which we see then also merch maybe starting as merchants and then becoming functionaries in is already before the Sui. Uh, Tang period, and we see how they bring their their also their fashion styles to to the grave cult and so on. And we have these these Soktian letters which indicate we have this far-reaching connection. So we have an agent sitting in Samarkand and another one sitting in Chang'an and reporting that the city is plundered by the Huns in the fourth century. So these are all, all, only only bits bits and pieces which we may connect to each other uh, other and have then the idea that something which is only in this one passage is described for the Radhania that we have similar phenomena in the earlier in the earlier periods, but but uh, uh, yeah, as, as, I would guess you know the evidence uh, as much better than I do. But that is that also the basis of what what I imagine somehow how 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 we we can we can uh, imagine how these networks worked. Yeah, no, I, I, about the the, the match, I completely agree. So it's extremely difficult to trace uh, uh, the, uh, the, the scale uh, of this corporation and, and the, the capacity to, to be connected with the other group in the other area. Just one, one, one clarification. When, so on the side of you, on, on the supply, you are very convincing. So I'm coming with you. Yeah. Still again on, on the side of the demand. So yeah. a, 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 a Frankish peasant or an Iberian peasant what can I offer in exchange for these nice things from uh, from the uh, <laughs> so um so i would say if we again talk about about the garnet it's local communities but within these local communities it's still in the graves of maybe the, the, the local elite mm -hmm. so it's 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 not that that we have garnet in every grave but it's not that this is these are only the princes, but this may be maybe the head the head of the village or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 also that we have a social um, distinction also with with these pro, uh, products as such. But there are more widespread right, they're spread beyond the centers, beyond people like Gregory of Tours or whatever, to also small smaller settlements at at even at the Bavarian periphery. Okay. Uh, so this 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 I meant with with say okay. wider um, wider uh, demand. Uh, so, but of, it, it's not it's not the mass product. You do not find it in, in, in every every grave. Yeah. Okay, that, this is clarify a lot. Of yeah, yeah. And uh, do you may I the last uh, the last things? Uh, all the question of okay. all things you and, want. Uh, do you think that this demand by the the head of the village or so the local elite in order to achieve these nice things from uh, India uh, in some way? affected the relationship inside the village between the local elite and the, the peasant producing population in terms of uh, demand. So I want to achieve something uh, yeah. expensive, so, so I'm asking more to from yeah. my peasants. Yeah. So that's, um, if I remember correctly, it, it's sometimes since I read the, the book of, of Trauschke, what we also find out then some kind of imitation so that with local with local material, they imitate the more exotic uh, product. So so things which look like garnet or we also have these cowrie shells from the from the Red Sea, which are more far distributed, maybe they were, were cheaper, but that you also have some some ideas of imitation, uh, say beyond those who can afford it 
by others who who still think uh, uh, want to 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 have the same or similar similar kind kind of material. Um, so that, that we would again indicate that these are signs of distinction. Uh, of course, that's also the idea that the exchange of these objects also is there to to establish. Uh, ties of allegiance. So there's a, a, a local prince, which is then distributing this material to, to the village heads or whatever, so that we also have non-commercial non forms of, of exchange. That's, 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 of course, also all possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Further questions, comments, remarks? Uh... Compliments. <laughs> Please feel free to. Ah, Sabina Walter. Please, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, so let's start with the compliments. This was really nice. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it was exactly the right mixture of things I kind of already knew and things I didn't know. So this is uh, really <laughs> enlightening without being confusing. Um, you mentioned a lot of concepts that people can use concerning like material culture and um, global concepts of history. Um, I think the ones that are to me a little new and I'm not completely sure about is um, lateral and vertical. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if I understood you correctly, um, the, the lateral connectivity, the, the lateral connections on the global level um, in, in late antiquity, early medieval times, um, that's like uh, a kind of symmetrical exchange between elites usually, right? Like um, yep. precious stones mm -hmm. and exotic animals and uh, diplomatic gifts going in between those places, going from one court to the other. And um, it doesn't really affect a lot of people in this instance. And then the, the vertical connection is kind of when um, the exchange starts trickling down into the everyday life of normal people, like mm -hmm. people who are not princes or um, kings or emperors or whatever. Is, is that uh, how um, the concept works? So the idea is that, that there's an interplay between lateral and vertical. So lateral is, is basically is, is the geographical dimension. So that things are exchanged over larger distances, this is most cases, what we know about are of course, is in the narrative side elite exchanges. But even if, if uh, for instance, the, the, the king of India is sending some orange trees to the caliph in Baghdad, this may have a vertical dimension because then they start to, to grow orange trees. And then we have these, this trickling down uh, in the wider communities, changing food with and, and so on. So there, there can be an interplay. Bailey, of course, developed this for the 19th century, where, of course, it's clear if, if the, uh, the colonial power is coming and bringing uh, 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 cotton from, from, from somewhere and, and growing it in, in, in America, and then, you, of course, it's modifying everything. It's, you have mathematical examples. But the, the lateral is, 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 is more or less the geographical dimension. And it can have an interplay or is normally also a precondition to a certain extent to the vertical dimension because then we have this process that these larger scale entanglements also connected to, to practices, uh, silkworms and growing them are then trickling down and changing also communities beyond the elites. That's more or less the, the idea, yeah. Okay, great. That, that makes it clearer. Thank you. Uh, so like... Um, there are things that kind of lend themselves to the concept of the vertical um, connections, like growing a new sort of plant, uh, growing silk uh, worms and, and the uh, Maulbeerbaum, was is that uh, of English? Mulberry, mulberry trees. <laughs> exactly, the mulberry yeah. trees uh, that, that you need for them and, and importing all of the practices connected to that and so on and so on. And then there are things like elephants um, which usually don't lend themselves to like actual vertical connections because at best the knowledge about elephants can trickle down into normal yeah. people's everyday life but yeah. as far as I can see there's no point in history where people in let's say uh, Germany um, have 
elephants in their everyday lives like uh no, of course as so, so the, of course with one elephant of course you cannot start uh, uh producing more elephants um and um there you have the vertical dimension of course it's it's not say as far reaching but of course uh, this is what i wanted to show with the tank gram of course a lot of communities were involved in bringing the elephant to charlemagne they saw the elephant the people in vercelli had to feed him an entire winter and we also have in a later source i don't i forgot it maybe it's valafrid of strabo uh, referring that that various people also came from around as far as possible from uh, from aachen to see the elephant so uh, it had it had maybe some some vertical uh, effect on on the imagination of people. Uh, that that's it's I almost imagined this when the first giraffe uh, arrived in Vienna in the 1820s uh, in the zoo. Uh, we we know from from contemporary that, that it was a big uproar. So it, thousands of people wanted to see the poor animals who were frightened most probably. Um, so that's that's that's. Of course, then the effect would be, of course, then this was attributed to the glory of the emperor, to the Habsburgs, and then to Charlemagne, that this kind of animal is arriving. Uh, but of course, it's different uh, than to the enduring entanglements via then for generations now we start to grow mulberry trees or, 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 or silkworms, yeah. Please, other wants to comment? Or... Paolo, Paolo, please. Oh. Uh, um, do you mention uh, in passing the debate about the Justinianic plague? Um, okay, there is a, a huge debate in this moment, in particular from uh, between my colleague in Tubingen and my ex colleague in, in Kingston. So, I don't want to say my, my thought on this, but I would like to ask your thought about the uh, impact of the Justinianic plague, in particular the demographic impact. If you can, if you see really uh, a change, uh, in particular in supply, considering that you are analyzing this aspect of, uh, of the connectivity. Um, that's... In terms of supply, that's 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 really tricky because it's always hard to quantify this uh, before and and say after after the plague. Uh, again, what we can see is is in this in these graves, for instance, in Aschheim or in Altiading, where they where they found the 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 first the first genomes of of the plague. We also have these objects, uh, the garnet and the cowrie shells, and that this continues also after after, after the plague. However, what what the archaeologists tell us, and they, this is based on on on, on a, an, an analysis of, of of several dozens of graveyards, especially in Germany, is um, what they can tell from the number of 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 of, of graves is that obviously it had, didn't have the the severe demographic impact which we have uh, reconstructed on the basis of the written sources for say Gaul or Italy or, or the Byzantine Empire. Because there you have a growing number of, of, of burials, mm -hmm. uh, which would happen in the case of a plague, you would have one peak and then you would have less burials because you have less people. But uh, this is not the case there. So the interpretation is there that in this, say, more remote parts, uh, in, in, uh, outside of the still more urbanized regions of Gaul or of Italy, there may have been not that big effect, maybe beyond beyond elites, because we have also these genomes were found in elite burials where we have uh, these exotic uh, uh, pieces, so maybe that was also their, their their bad fate that they were buying these things and thereby also maybe got infected. Um, so that's that 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 would be a special case. Otherwise, it's it's I as I would guess also you know the material which was collected by by Mordecai and Eisenberg. Uh, that's also not. The kind of quantification which helps them in terms of of economy really in in most cases so it's about inscriptions or the activities of the state maybe maybe coinage but that's that's also not clear nicolas schindel for instance had a different idea that there was actually an effect on on the circulation maybe it was an effect also of the plague on on the circulation of coinage um so at the moment i i'm i'm i'm, I'm very reluctant to 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 say anything in this regard the one thing I can say, uh, because uh, we know now the pathogen somewhere came from East Asia, 
we have we have we have census figures for for China in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there were some epidemics around. We don't know if there was a similar plague epidemic. Uh, the most recent uh, interpretations by sinologists say that the plague is around in South China since the fifth century, but it's not described as a mass as a mass disease. The singular cases, so it's around, but it's not like no description like Procopius or or John of Ephesus, where tens of thousands of people are dying. This, this you do not find, with one exception, a, a siege of 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 of, of, of a city, and there the, the census figures in north north China they are they are grow, going up. So there's there's no effect of the similar kind. But uh, of course that's also tricky. They are yeah, also yeah. fragmentary, and um, and we don't know if, if there was anything around like the Justinianic plague. But otherwise, it's it's um, I would I would say at the moment it's it's very hard to say anything. It's maybe if if uh, if what Jörg Trauschke did, if one if we continues along these lines, and then really sees if if in other regions, uh, maybe in Gaul or in Italy, one can find more of this uh, of 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 an ups and downs, maybe also of supply of this material. Yeah. Very clear. Thanks. <laughs> Please, if there is other participants who wants to, to ask something for our guest or I don't see. No, no more question, observation. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, if you, so uh, we we can we can close this af impressive after so with with uh, this uh, dense afternoon with this um, I repeat impressive talk by by our Johannes Preiser Capelle and so thank you for for being here thank you everyone. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, <laughs> Johannes, for your effort, for your for your generosity, yeah, for for for, for sharing uh, the PDF uh, presentation and the materials, bibliographic, bibliographical material um, with Walter Obvega. So <laughs> I see <laughs> this. Uh, thank you. So uh, next, uh, the next, uh, um, the next lecture at the end of May. I don't remember uh, more the, the date, but the, the last Friday of May uh, of May um, is with um, Martin Hellman uh, on uh, Tyronia notes and the manuscripts of the Carolingian period, and so. Thank you, thank you, Johannes. Thank you, everyone. And thank you <laughs> I remain much. here to close the door. <laughs> the final yeah. act of this. Many thanks for the invitation and for the for the questions and for the discussion from which I also profited a lot. And and uh, yeah, I wish you all a, a wonderful weekend. And and yes. hope that maybe in the in somewhere in the next months we can also meet in person again. <laughs> no more again or wherever. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Giuseppe, Paolo, Roberto. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I see your names here. Yeah. And Sophie Kofarik. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sophie. Uh,